What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about hernias. These are very interesting lectures, so let's get right into them. So when we talk about hernias, there is a bunch of different types, and I think let's go first through the inguinal hernias. Uh, inguinal hernias, there's two different type, like types, right? And we usually base this on the position of where the bowel herniates with respect to the inferior epigastric artery. So if we look here, here's a normal type of patient, no underlying hernia going on whatsoever. Here you see is the inferior epigastric vessels. If I see that the bowel kind of herniates lateral to the inferior epigastric artery through this inguinal ring down into the area of the scrotum, this is indicative of an indirect inguinal hernia. All right, so it herniates through both of the inguinal rings lateral to the inferior epigastric artery. Now, the reason this would happen is someone's having a very high amount of intra-abdominal pressure. There's many, many different reasons for this. Maybe it's heavy lifting. Maybe they're trying to move boxes. Whatever it may be, this can create the opportunity for the bowel to herniate right through this inguinal ring. Another type of hernia would be a direct inguinal hernia. So now, with respect to the inferior epigastric vessels, here it is. Now, look over here at a direct. Where is it with respect to the inferior epigastric it's medial and it's actually moving through the wall herniating through the last part of the inguinal ring and out to the side here this is an example of a direct inguinal hernia again same usually cause or etiology is some massive increase in intra-abdominal pressure massive coughing or sneezing or heavy lifting this is usually going to trigger this herniation the next type of hernia would be a femoral hernia. These are actually pretty bad. If they do happen, they have a high risk of incarceration and strangulation. So this is basically when the bowel herniates through something called the femoral canal. So as you can see here, this is kind of our inguinal ligament. Right below it, you have something called the femoral triangle, which consists of the femoral artery, the femoral vein, and usually the femoral nerve and some lymph nodes. Right here in this vicinity is the femoral ring. What happens is parts of the actual small bowel can herniate right through that femoral canal and definitely increase the risk of this being stuck, incarcerated, and strangulated. The last type of hernias is called ventral hernias, and these are usually on the abdominal wall. And they usually can herniate through a couple different parts. One is they can herniate through an incision. So if a patient has a prior surgical incision from some type of procedure where they had to have done on their abdomen, and that herniates around or through the incision, that would be an ind indicative of what's called an incisional hernia. Another one is where the bowel herniates right through the umbilical ring. And if it does herniate through the umbilical ring, which is very common with obesity and pregnancy where they have a weak kind of linea alba, this can definitely cause it to herniate right in through the umbilical ring. It would be very obvious and a visible palpable mass. Oftentimes, regardless of the etiology, you'd be able to see a visible and relatively painful mass that may be outside of the actual body. For example, I may be able to see an inguinal hernia here, a femoral hernia here, an incisional hernia, or an umbilical hernia, and it would be very visible type of appearance. Now, with hernias, they can be visible masses, but they also can cause complications, and it's important to know which type of hernia you have. For example, when a hernia occurs, especially femoral and inguinal hernias, sometimes when the bowel herniates out through that defect in the inguinal wall or through the inguinal rings or through the femoral canal, if it does, it can actually become stuck in this like little defect in that wall. And what happens is it can compress this portion of the bowel and compress this portion of the bowel. And then all the food and fluid and air gets stuck in this portion without an ability to exit out. And this can lead to an obstruction. This can cause proximal dilation, distension, and then distal decompression, which can definitely have a very profound effect. Like what? Well, it can cause small bowel obstructions, which usually presents with like cavo features, right? So cramping abdominal pain, abdominal distension, vomiting, obstipation. So if a patient comes in with a visible mass, inguinal, femoral most commonly, and then on top of that, they present with the cavo features, think that they've now gone from having a hernia that was just present, a visible mass, to now having it cause a closed loop obstruction. You're compressing it at a proximal and distal point, and there's no way for this to get out. These are scary, and the reason why is the closed loop obstructions, they pinch the artery here, and they pinch the arteries here. And you pretty much get no arterial blood flow to this portion of the small bowel. 
What can result is you can develop severe bowel ischemia. Bowel ischemia could be indicative by an elevated lactate level, which could be seen on labs if you draw them up. But the other complication is that if this becomes ischemic and not reversed, it could become infarcted, die, and become very weak. And then it can perforate, causing a pneumoperitoneum. The other thing is if it does perforate and it causes peritonitis, this literally can increase the risk of the patient becoming septic. But usually this is a severe case of hernias. I think a way that a patient should kind of be evaluated with a hernia is if they have a visible mass, the first thing that you should go and do is, literally, I'm not even kidding, push on the mass and see if you can push it back into position. So if it's an inguinal hernia, see if you can push it out of the scrotum and back up into the abdomen. If it's femoral, push it through the femoral canal. If it's an umbilical, push it back through the umbilical ring. If it's an incisional, push it back in through the incision. If it is reducible, great, because that's an uncomplicated hernia. And eventually, if this does consistently cause problems, you can surgically repair this, but it's more on an elective basis. It's not something that you have to take care of right away. If it's not, the next thing that you have to say is, okay, I have a complicated hernia. It could be strangulated within that defect in the wall of the, ing the inguinal area, the femoral canal, or the umbilical ring, or it could be incarcerated. And that's important to be able to differentiate. So I think the next question that you have to ask is, okay, I can't reduce the hernia. If I can't reduce the hernia, I then wanna know, do they have any features of small bowel obstruction or bowel ischemia? Because if it's compressing it at the two points, that closed loop obstruction, this can be really bad. So how do I do that? First, I'd wanna obtain abdominal x-ray. If the abdominal x-ray shows me that I have these dilated bowel loops, and then air fluid levels. Now I'm concerned that this turned in from just a simple hernia to a bowel obstruction. That's important to identify. The next thing is also, I would consider checking for bowel ischemia by checking a lactate level. And lactate levels, if they're super elevated, could be indicative of some pretty bad bowel ischemia. The other thing is if I see any evidence that suggests an obstruction, I want to make sure that I use the best possible test, and that's usually a CT of the abdomen and pelvis, and that would definitely help me to identify a potential hernia that's incarcerated or strangulated. The next thing I have to determine here is how do I treat these hernias? And uncomplicated hernias that are easily reducible, you reduce it, and then you can honestly just stand by and see if they develop any further recurrences. And if it gets to the point where it's causing more problems, it's causing issues, you can then re refer the patient for a surgical consultation, and they can get some type of elective surgery. Usually if they're very small hernias, especially in children, you can do something called a herniorophy, which is basically where you just kind of surgically close the defect within wherever the wall is, whether it's the inguinal canal, whether it's within the femoral canal, the umbilical area, you'll close that off. Another option is usually if the hernias are really large or they're inguinal hernias, we can do something called a hernioplasty. So you'll kind of open up this area of the wall. And then what you'll do is you'll push the bowel contents back into the abdomen and put a synthetic mesh in place and then help to suture that area closed. And that's gonna be more particularly beneficial for those patients with pretty big hernias or they have an inguinal hernia. And it's just their anatomy would benefit more from a hernioplasty. I think the question to ask though is if it's not un if it's not an uncomplicated type of um, hernia, the next one is is it incarcerated? In other words, it's not reducible, but they don't have any true evidence of this thing being really causing bowel obstruction or bowel ischemia. If that's the case, then I should then try my best to really reduce it. And I may have to give the patient some more pain medication, something to chill them out, relax them, and then I may have to really work hard to push this back in. And if I can't do that, then I may need to refer them to a first surgical evaluation and they may require more of an urgent herniorophy or an urgent hernioplasty. Again, small children, herniorophy, large or inguinal hernioplasty. The last one is if it's strangulated. In other words, it's actually causing bowel ischemia. They have bowel obstruction. You don't have time. I wouldn't even try to reduce this. They need to go to surgery because if the patient has bowel ischemia or bowel obstruction, they're at really high risk of perforation and sepsis. I need to get them to the OR. I need to go ahead and I need to, again, maybe potentially resect out the disease portion of the hernia. And then after that, maybe I do end to end anastomosis, close up the area there and may depend upon me doing a hernioplasty or herniorophy afterwards. But again, this is how we would go about treating hernias. All right, my friends, that covers hernias. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys did enjoy it. And as always, until next time.